A2IM, the collective voice of independent music. The subject of this panel has evolved a little bit. Um, it is how can non-com radio help indie, it was from how can non-com radio help indie labels and artists to how can indie labels and non-com radio help each other. With that in mind, um, I wanted to start just a quick step back and do intros. I'll just call out names so that people aren't talking over each other. I'm just going to go in the order of the way everybody is on my screen. So Stephanie, let's start with you. Hi, uh, I'm Stephanie. I work uh, for Bayonet Records and the label manager. Um, I just have a background in uh, wrangling musicians and DIY music. I play in bands. I book shows and I've been managing the label for the last couple of years. And Crystal? I work for Epitaph and Anti. I've been there quite a long time doing radio promotion. And while I started uh, primarily doing Epitaph with commercial alternative, I have for the last 17 years <laughs> been doing more of the anti-radio at non-com and AAA formats and overseeing college and specialty as well. Tyson? Hi, I'm Tyson. Uh, I work at, at Concord. Um, you know, Concord really prides itself on, on being a part of the independent artist and music community and, and, and really being artist centric. Um, so, so being on a conversation like this is, is really fun and exciting. I come from ADA, also a big part of the independent community. And before that was at uh, Virgin Records. So I feel like, you know, having sort of both experiences being on a major label side and now being on the independent label side for the past 20, 15, 20 years, um, I've really found the passion of, of being on the independent side and, and being this close to the independent community. Um, so I um, look forward to this panel today. And Jess. My name is Jessica and I own uh, an independent uh, artist development and marketing, music marketing company called Cosign. I've been doing radio for almost two decades now and as an independent um, resource for artists and labels and, you know, that such thing. My company specializes in radio promotion, but also does uh, licensing. So pitching for sync at film and TV with us, our, our small catalog of artists. And we also do uh, music driven marketing initiatives. Um, and last year we did our first original content project for the city of New York, a local music radio show, which was amazing and very exciting. <laughs> I'm Hannah. Also, I realized I should introduce myself. I am yeah. the marketing, the U.S. and Canadian marketing director for a Secretly Group, uh, which is independent labels, uh, Dead Oceans, Jag Jaguar, and Secretly Canadian. Um, before that, I did radio uh, for Secretly Group for quite a few years, and then before that, uh, did radio at an independent agency uh, most of that time, thankfully, with Jess. Um, so getting into uh, a first question, um, you know, stations are, are always going to be better equipped than us to know their audiences, to know their towns and cities and, and communities. Um, and so, you know, rather than, rather than try to, um, you know, go too many steps down the road and, and, and create like overly customized tools or engagement. I think it, 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 it falls to us to create, I think, tools and resources for them that um, are customizable, are, are just sort of like broad things that we can offer, um, you know, alongside music uh, to help them be vital in their communities. And so with that in mind, um, I was curious, what tools you think we can provide to stations that are like broadly useful, um, but that, you know, sort of give them a place to pick up from there. Um, and maybe we'll go backwards and just start with you. Some of just some of the things that you've done in your work with stations. I mean, it depends. I, I think obviously the objective when it comes to this stuff it, that, that's always going to decide what kind of toolbox you're providing for folks. We've done, um, I mean, I think for a lot of stations, access to artists and access to 
content, especially now, as more and more stations are are kind of driving themselves and and to become more content creators or not more content creators, but content creators alongside of like the amazing programming stuff that they're already doing. The, the necessity to be present, like present on multiple platforms, just like it is for any, any of us, you know, is, you know, 10 times as more important as them. Um, so I think like, you know, on a very like strict, like if you're thinking about like how to build with, with a, a label or you know a station on like a release or an artist or something like that I think that there's like you know there's a level of access and there's like a, an amount of kind of tools related tools that you can offer exclusive content which you can offer but I really think like one thing that we've been experimenting with a lot more is kind of like figuring out like how can our partners directly support stations in a way that's like meaningful to them like not one thing I've heard over and over again from stations is like, don't don't always just give us like a pre-made thing. That's like, you know, that's like something that we expect them to kind of like amplify out into the world. Like talk to them about like what's what's important, what's relevant and work with them to kind of create this content piece or like some kind of moment for them that's like special and unique to their audience and their, you know, their listener. So like that can be anything that if, cause who knows, like, you know, to someone that could be an interview and that's like really great. They might have like a really great, like a really engaged audience and that's kind of what they're looking to do. But to someone else, like maybe it's like a video piece, maybe it's an IG live, maybe it's like, you know, like we had, we, we had been talking about, like maybe it's something bigger, fun drives or, or underwriting or just supporting programming that's important to your label, your artist that you appreciate and you see happening and you don't want to go away. Um, I think like the, the ongoing theme right now is like talk to people and ask, like ask what it is, ask what, ask what you can do to help them and mm -hmm. how, how you can be most effective and then let the conversation listen and let the conversation go from there no i'm just saying like i don't mean to like diatribe about it but i think it's going to be different for everybody you know i agree i think that's the beauty of the non-commercial format unlike commercial radio unlike say the alternative or the active rock or country formats the beauty of the non-commercial format is that every station is so unique to their market you know and they play they can play just such completely different types of music while still playing some of the same music. So their audience, they really cater to their audience, whereas commercial radio is just so homogenistic. So I think Jess is right. You have to ask the station, what are you looking for? Some stations want artists' video content. Some stations don't. Some stations are really looking for, you know, artists to speak up mm -hmm. and uh, give them sort of liners about their fun drives. Some stations just really want a performance-based thing. So each station wants something different. And some stations are in little tiny markets and they are okay with a performance that say was maybe used for a World Cafe if they don't carry a World Cafe. And then they get their own personalized interview that they can edit together. So that as well as fun drives, um, signed merch, or you know, just LPs, things that they can really use. I mean, I've over this COVID period, I've done actual just donations to these stations, you know, via anti totally underwriting. You know, I we I've been having a lot of zoom calls with radio to kind of see hey what's going on where are you guys at what's what can we do to help you and each station is different and it's been really great you know and um just kind of yeah talking to them and seeing what they want it's not a cookie cookie cutter format and so you can't approach it with a cookie cutter kind of promotional type thing yeah, the key point I think both of you have said is, you know, know your station, listen to your station. I think that's where it comes down to because each station says something different. Like you sort of get to know what are their key moments that you can kind of be a part of. And just because as you talk to them, know that that's kind of their main priority for this year or they have three or four of these main priorities. How can you 
in, in, in intertwine with what they do on, on those things like, you know, TMD's first Thursday or the sessions at YEP in Pittsburgh. Like when you have artists just know, okay, I have this for, for this feature that I know you guys like, can we fit them in there? And I think Crystal brought up a really, really good point, particularly for this format is because like, like you said, there's all different kinds of music that can play. Some, some of the stations all play the same, same music, but then each station will play this type of, of, of artist or genre while the other one will stay away from that and play something else. So I think the way that we can sort of help in that focus is there may be an artist that is perfect for station Y in this, in this county, but may not be our priority at the time. Make sure that you kind of know like, okay, this, this station really likes this artist that we have that is touring right now, or has a new record out right now, may not be a priority for us, may not be a radio priority, but we know it works for the station. Let's see if we can do something with them for this artist. Yeah, I know from a label perspective, um, we, so like my first priority is like, is sort of to build things around the artist on our roster. And we have a very varied roster, all different kinds of musicians. Um, so when I think about non-com radio, uh, I mean, it's a little, it's frustrating because I've done a lot of work around tour dates, um, and finding radio stations in town where the musicians are touring through and, and, you know, it's as easy as like checking out their website and their socials to, if you're not already familiar with the station, like, um, would, would our artists genuinely be like a helpful addition to what they have on rotation? And then like, I don't know, going out, because you know, we, we, have, we have like experimental electronic artists and we have people that swing more like the chill folk side. There's all kinds of stuff. And um, yeah, just like catering, like thinking about the artist, where they fit and then sort of taking scope of like the big picture and finding places for these people to fit in. And it sort of, it cuts down on um, annoying encounters like cookie cutter kind of like how you were saying before jessica just asking people what they need it's like it's it, it's a you can hit 100 stations but maybe only 25 of them need to need to actually hear from you and you can you can um really personalize in that way and i think i mean you know the, those it also means that there's a higher likelihood that that you can align you can find those fits of like what serves a station and an audience in a town can align with what an artist like does or doesn't want to do. You know, like going back to, I forget whether it was Crystal or Tyson talking about alternative. It's like alternative wants like a very short menu of two or three things done two or three different ways. And the great thing about non-com in college is they have room for, you know, the person that that hates liners and maybe doesn't want to be that visible in promo but would do an instagram takeover and the person who would do an interview and the person who would do you know a performance or something like special and bespoke or something signed like there's there's places for um i think every artist's inclination as well um which which helps yeah i mean i think that like Non-com radio is kind of like, it's like, a, it's kind of a treasure, you know, like nothing, nothing exists, nothing is adventurous, nothing is thoughtful, nothing is poignant and potentially relevant <laughs> exists out there in, broad, in the world of broadcast right now. And like, truthfully, as promotion people and as labels, we need to be doing like whatever we can to support them. So when Crystal's talking about donating from the label to, to a station, like that's something we should be doing all the time. Like we are sustaining members of like, I don't know how many stations, but like truthfully, like we come to these people all the time. We ask them to play our records. We ask them to feature our artists and like amplify our message. And if we're not like doing something to help like raise them up and like make their lives easier then like we're just taking basically, you know? So like the least we can do is be involved in that conversation and be like, you're talking about Stephanie, be aware of what's going on with them and like, collaborating like even if you know not not everybody has the means to like you know go crazy and like maybe you know even if you're doing like a five dollar monthly donation the places where like your you know your main artist is like it's their hometown and you want to be like I just I feel like little gestures and like 
stuff like that go a really long way and also like really benefit you as a, an industry person as far as like knowing what's going on, knowing your audience, you know? One thing you know about non-com radio, I'll make this really quick, Crystal. You know about non-com radio is they are dedicated listeners. When you have top 40 radio or alternative radio, they're just kind of sometimes just flipping the channel. It's just background music. Like when you have the listeners are dedicated to those stations, they're members of those stations, they connect with those stations. So when you do something with them, promotion, a performance, session, content you send, that those listeners that much more engaged in what you are doing with them than probably any other format. I, I agree because I feel like with this, it's, it's very much a relationship. It's not a business transaction. So even with the artists, you know, the artists build relationships with all of these stations, whether they're in Philly or Ignacio, Colorado, right? Mm -hmm. And there is no small station, I, I feel, because a station like KSUT will be forever grateful if you get an artist to stop by there, you know? And, and they will always support all of your artists and they'll be more willing to step out on your little small baby band that's plays bongos or something, you know, because you've helped them out and because they are eclectic and because you didn't just treat them like, yeah, I don't have time for that station because they're not a monitored station, you know, and, and case in point, 10 years ago, the monitored AAA list looked vastly different than it does now. So all of the stations that were kind of tossed away or like, oh, I don't really care. FUV is not KBCO. Now they're the big players in town. So that's just a lesson to be learned that there is no small station and there is, you've got to just treat, we're indies. We are slow on the totem pole as far as, you know, the world of like Sony and Capital and things like that. So I just feel like that's why KG and you and Boulder, awesome. They play a very eclectic mix of music. Not that I'm going to ignore a bigger station, but I want to treat all the stations as they're important and give them the tools that they need. You know, maybe I can't get you know, the biggest artist to come by, but maybe I can, because if you just ask an artist and most of the artists that we work with care about music and they care about getting their music out and not playing the corporate BS, then you can get a big artist to maybe go by these small stations if you just ask. So it's just worth a shot. And they're paying, and these people are storytellers just like we are. They're telling, they're like listening and absorbing and learning about all the artists and the labels out there. So that artist's message is important. And similarly, so is the label's message. So like, I don't know. I mean, I feel like supporting, like, you know, we're all trying to like, I don't know. It, they're they're invested in music differently like Tyson was talking about you know like it's it's a different relationship with their listeners you know they're people who are excited to discover which is so so rare we're a little pocket of the radio world here but it's a dedicated loyal invested pocket that will come back and, and continue paying attention. And like, you know, that we, if we look at what's going on right now, like that's why like the artists we promote, the messages we promote are so important because they're going to look at us and they want to represent the things which represent them, the people, the artists, the messages, which they feel reflect their listeners and their programming. Crystal I, I, said, thing, said something that I wanted to amplify, the, the part of, of paying attention to those smaller stations. I think as independent labels, it's even more important for us to list, to to deal with, you know, I, the term I always say is work with anyone who has a stick. If they're a radio station and I've never heard of them before or they're not on the panel and they're asking for a CD or an interview or a phone, let's do it. That's, you know, most likely a major label is going to pass on that, ignore the email, not return the phone call. I think that's something as independent labels, we should have that bond with these smaller stations. To your point, we are the smaller sort of like fish in the big pond. Let's give that sort of same respect to these smaller stations that maybe we don't have uh, as much of history with, but if they're com coming to us about something about an artist that they want to support, let's be there for them. There's a lot to be said about like not um, sort of 
pandering to an algorithm. And I feel like the easiest way to do that is to just uh, go like one person at a time. Um, Cause you know, we've had, we've had some stuff that Bayonet has put out that did get swept up in the algorithm in this funny way where, you know, you see the counts go up, the numbers go up in this crazy way and you, it's a bit of a mystery and you might spend a couple of months trying to solve it and like chase this thing, but it's, it's not yours. It, it's, it was rained down upon you by like, you know, mysterious executives and offices far away, but like there it's, it's just not sustainable essentially. So when you think about non-com radio and the, one-on-one -on -one relationships you're making it's like you I don't know it's it's classic it's DIY style you get you find you find your people one at a time and when you find them that way they stick around there's no they don't go away they don't go away basically it, exactly and their listeners like Tyson was saying those are the listeners that are going to be going to the shows and buying the merch even even if they only have 20 listeners those 20 people are going to be far more active than say a listener that's just going through K-Rock because that's what they've always listened to. And they just want to hear a song they know, but they're never going to go buy new music from that artist. Right. So you're feeding the people that music is their passion. And that's what our artists are looking for. And also these stations are all the stations that are big on social justice and good causes. And so that's what most of our artists and we want. And it's just kind of like feeding, feeding the good people out there and making the voice for, for all those things bigger and better, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it bears mention that, that, you know, like everyone's taking a cl close look at where their media is coming from and, and you know, the the soil underneath the things that they're they're consuming in terms of news reporting and arts reporting and culture, um, and that noncom is is it's just a much more you know no no place is unscathed but it's a much more ethical center of media um, it's a much more it's much more independent it's much more freestanding um, yeah. It's by and large, you know, listener funded, community funded. Um, and with that just comes like a different, a different mission and a different set of, of responsibilities, a different like guiding principle. Um, and they tell the story, they help tell the story because, you know, when k -Rock's not going to, you know, most of these commercial stations don't back sell and front sell music anymore. And yeah. you know, one thing that non -com's still great at is talking about the record, talking about the album, talking about the artist. And that definitely benefits what we're all doing. Yeah, actually, you know, with that, Crystal, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say that artists themselves are listening to these stations. Artists in these communities are, a lot of them actually have shows on these, on these stations. So artists themselves are, not only are they supporting them uh, with their music, but they're also supporting them by being an active member of their community as well. So that's all I was going to say. Um, I did want to pivot slightly. I mean, we're, you know, I think it's more important than ever to be doing our best to serve stations, but this is a, you know, a, a majority label panel um, and we work for artists and Jess works for labels and artists both. Um, so just talk a bit about any, um, about any ways that you've seen, uh, you know, stations or a station, whether it's a case study or like an approach you had on a campaign, whatever, whatever it may be that you've seen benefit your artists um, that was maybe outside of, of standard airplay. I think any, any video content is helpful for somebody um, like me who's trying to just sort of like keep, keep the stream going, like keep people engaged. Like don't forget about our, don't forget about our artists and whenever a musician can go through and do um, like a recorded session is great, but whenever they set up a video camera and then they upload it on YouTube later, um, it's great because you can use different <laughs> pieces of it over the course of like several weeks. You can, it, it goes back and forth. You push the radio station and then they push your stuff on their socials. And you know it's not very cool to talk about like social media stuff right now, but it's like my, I don't know, nobody's playing shows right now. So we're kind of in this weird place of, 
prioritizing digital marketing, which I guess is, I guess it's about time to learn that stuff. But yeah, <laughs> I think any video, any like video content that radio stations can like offer an artist coming through on a tour or, you know, even just like going out for a weekend show, particularly like colleges, I'm talking a lot about college radio specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, college shows pay really well, they feed their musicians, and then if you can get in there for a video, a video of some sort, playing a song or an interview, it's like, it will, it pays off for a long time. That's, that's my opinion. I mean, I agree. Look at, look at a station like KEXP. They are an international like voice out there. I mean, they have listeners all over the world. So you do a KEXP session for a young band and that's just so much exposure right there outside of just the Seattle market. So I, and okay, so you go do a World Cafe session. That's in 150 markets, right? And they're always championing, you know, new and upcoming artists. So um, I just feel like all of those sessions that maybe the artists are going, oh, I don't want to do. I really do feel like it's, uh, again, it's part of that relationship building with those artists. And those stations always support those artists um, throughout their career because it is, it's not just about a song. It's about a relationship. And uh, once you, once you get that band or that artist in to the station or, you know, to create that relationship, um, I really feel like it lasts for their entire career. I'm, I'm curious. Um, I think that from out here, I'm, I'm, I'm a degree removed from radio now, I'd say, but from out here, it seems like stations have been doing a pretty good job adjusting some of their expectations around things that they would have been really diehard happen in person, um, getting more comfortable with those things happening digitally in a world where, where no one's touring. Um, I'm curious what your guys' experience has been with that. What, what pivots you've seen stations either get comfortable with or make, or just like things, things in the last couple of months that feel like they might be durable for the future. We had an M Ward record coming out really just right as all of this was happening. And uh, so he did a virtual concert and we offered it to a bunch of stations to stream online. Now, if this had happened, say, six months ago and uh, he didn't really want to go into stations and do things and we offered this virtual concert for them to stream, no half those stations wouldn't have wanted a part of it because they would want to do their own special M Ward thing. So I feel like they're more open to going, okay, we can share. We're sort of all in this together, you know? So I think that they're going to, I think that at the end of the day, they're going to realize that their listeners are just excited to hear it and be part of it. They don't know that another market is having it. And so I think it's just kind of creating them being better with with sharing content and not being like, we just need our own session kind of thing. The ownership of it. Yeah. It's like, exactly. it's, it's exactly the same point, like getting content, but it can be shared with, with other stations kind of like goes back to that whole battle cry that we all used to deal with, with presents on shows. I think there's a little bit less of that as well. I'm granted we're not having shows right now, but as far as like your know, presents are, aren't as much of a, of a conflict that's still there, but not as much as they were say 10 years ago. And I think it's because what Crystal said is audience just wants to go to a show. Like they don't, you know, they're not going to not go to a show because they're a competing station with their favorite station is presenting it. That's not why they're going to go to the show because they like the band. And I think, you know, we're finding out that like listeners just want to have content and it doesn't need to be unique specifically. It doesn't need to be branded just for that station. They want to see their artists playing their favorite songs. And you can still make it, uh, you know, with, with content that other stations are getting, you can still find a way to incorporate branding and in, into that station by getting a personalized interview or doing something, you know, an extra song for this or a shout out here, you know, like I said, each station is different. So you can kind of find out exactly what they're looking for by, by uh, just utilizing the broader content, but then personalizing it for them. 
I mean, even yeah. broadcast um, audio changing content that you know you're not you didn't necessarily need to specifically record for them because we're all they're all in it together, just like they're dealing with like everyone else is. Yeah, um, I had two. We are short on time. Um, I had two short questions. I'm hoping I can squeeze into. One of them is just putting Stephanie on the spot, which I hope is okay. Um, which is, and, and is sort of taking a step back, but anticipating um, that viewers on this panel will be coming from a bunch of different um, kind of like seats and sizes and, and, and stages in their business. I mean, Bayonet uniquely was born very healthily in the streaming era, um, which is not the case with Epitaph or Concord or with Secretly, like this, you know. Um, just was born in like squarely in the streaming era, which by extension means a very different time for radio. Um, and maybe yes. this could have gone at the beginning, but I'm, I am curious to sort of pull back a step and hear from you kind of where radio fits in the grand scheme for you guys um, without that kind of grandfathered philosophy. Yeah, so I think uh, kind of like goes back to what I was saying before where as a label manager and you know doing like in our things as well it's like i am younger i did i listen to a lot of non-com radio um pre-streaming and i still i still tune in like pretty regularly to some of the stuff around brooklyn but i think it kind of goes back to before right i genuinely don't think as much about non-com radio until i know one of our artists is going on tour and it it's sort of like turns the light back on because it's happening in real life and a lot of our musicians um have found their following IRL like we don't we don't have musicians on our roster that that don't play shows or people that exist online exclusively they they tour they all tour pretty relentlessly and they go they play small shows they you know Beach Fossil's pretty big they play big shows but it's they'll go to a smaller town to play these big shows and and in this way that's like that's that's when this sort of like one fan at a time mentality will kick in for me where I'm just like I'll send posters for, for where the I you know we make tour posters and I'll send posters to the radio station and to the venue that they're playing in town and um yeah we I mean we do make a fair amount of our money from streaming revenue that's that's actually like a a huge portion of the money that we make and it's it, it still feels extremely necessary to engage with non-com radio because it exists in the real world you know especially now in this way where we're we're realizing how um just sort of nebulous and temporary everything is especially on the internet you know there's even just like questions of censorship that are that are coming through, we don't own these platforms. These these platforms own us in a lot of ways, and it's it's important to sort of engage. I don't know. Does does it make sense? Like non com yeah. to me it seems like the real world, and then streaming seems like a um, fun like mystery puzzle that we <laughs> try to you know we we try to appease them or something. Um, but you don't, it's, it's harder to have like one-on-one -on -one relationships with people at DSPs. Um, yeah, I don't know, does that answer your question? It does, I think it absolutely does. Um, I think it speaks maybe to some of the durability of non-com. Yes, that's it's not. The, it's not the whole world anymore, but in, in a world where everything feels really ephemeral or you know, we're, we're seeing more how ephemeral it is, um, you know, here is this format that is freestanding and is independent um, you know, and people have been calling almost dead for 25 years and is alive. And have been experiencing more engagement now during this time than like they have seen, you know, maybe more recently. I mean, I think, I think Stephanie's relationship with streaming, honestly, and just our relationship with streaming platforms, it's, it's complicated, right? Because everybody thought streaming was going to knock radio out of the water and radio is going to be dead. Well, no, like these stations have such loyal, dedicated fans, 
you know, they want, they're in it for the curation, they're in it for the discovery, but like how a label decides to give preference, whether it's to a DSP or, I mean, like, look at what happens with radio premieres now, you know, it's a totally different world than it used to be before those platforms existed. And like, we keep going back to the radio people again, we're, we're, you know, we want to partner with them. We want to work with them, but like now there's these, all these new rules. I mean, I think there, they would be, I would be interested honestly to have a larger conversation about how DSPs and radio and radio people can work together and be more like, like work, like not on the same page, but I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but just like kind of be working hand in hand on like creating some of these amazing editorial premiere moments without anybody getting their their feathers ruffled you know for like, like they're complementary in this way where it's like if 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 streaming can acknowledge it's which hasn't happened yet i think streaming is like this they you know there's this idea that it's all-knowing all-powerful whatever sort of this whole thing but i think if streaming when streaming hits it's hits a wall when they like can finally acknowledge where the boundaries of streaming can go, how far can streaming actually take music to listeners and to and find you new fans. Once streaming like draws that map, it'll be a lot easier for the rest of us to like, cause, you know, because the radio is still here and it's it's like vibrant and it's it's like the heart of like so many like just <clears throat> great and cool events and like scenes in this way. And it's like streaming can't do that and i feel like once streaming hits its wall and we draw the map there it'll be easy to like understand the new like contours of what non-com is but streaming streaming is still trying to like you know put their fingers in every pie in this way that might be making it kind of hard to see but they are they're complementary they there's there's they're not the same thing they don't actually overlap yeah. in very many areas there's definitely symbiosis there i mean that's so much because you you know just the fact that they exist now and just the fact that there's by definition still non-com radio stations that are listener supported they wouldn't exist if there wasn't that connection with listeners and obviously we all do it you know listen i listen to radio in the car or in the background while i'm, while I'm working and then you know, later on the day i'll go to streaming services like everyone does that that's why they're all existing together in the same way or a similar way that a retailer can 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 work together with with a concert venue or yep. a record label to bring together to to amplify one project there should be a similar way that a radio could probably do that with the streaming because they, they work off each other yeah, because neither one is going to knock the other out of the park. I think we've realized that. Like, we look at streaming in the amazing way that it's leveled the playing field for so many artists. Like, that's incredible. Like, the access to the amount of music that we have right now is, like, it's unbelievable. But, like, the radio and DSPs should, like, they amplify each other. Somebody hears something on the radio, they shazam it, they go listen to it on their streaming platform. Like, the streaming just doesn't have the ability to tell the story in the same way that your non-com stations do. And as independent labels and artists and promotion people, we need those people telling those stories. Like that is what gets people engaged. Like, like what Stephanie's talking about with streaming, like it's amazing when you have something on a playlist and it catches fire and you're like, hell yeah, this is awesome. But we need the other piece of the puzzle too for longevity. That's right. what, like I feel like it would like having a larger conversation about how these two worlds can work together would go such a long way. It's like it's constantly a kind of I see people knocking heads about it all the time, and it just feels like okay, guess what? Everybody's here to stay. Let's figure out how to make it happen. You know, well, streaming streaming doesn't know places really. Streaming doesn't know what life is like in Richmond. Streaming doesn't know what life is like in Ignacio, Colorado, or in Detroit, for that matter. Um, yeah. Stations At, do. Right, and I think that radio is just still so much more the place where you're going to discover a new artist, not a new song. Because on streaming, I've seen that people hear a song and they're, 
they don't even know who the artist is. I mean, I have an anecdote. The radio gives you the background and who the artist is and why the artist is important. Streaming might give you the song that you go, oh, and if you have time, you Shazam it, you figure out who the artist is. But if you're just listening passively, you might go, that's kind of a cool song. And then you walk away and forget about it. But radio, you hear who it is. Maybe you hear an interview and you're engaged and trying to find out who that artist is. So, I mean, I'm here for it all. I love it. Right. <laughs> you know, I want to be clear. I'm, I use it all and I use it all when I, when I pitch, when I talk to people, when I'm having conversations, it just seems like, it just seems like there, there should be like with like some symbiosis there, some synergy. Um, that I think would be a very interesting panel conversation, just putting out there. That's who I am. We have to end. Thank you all very, very much.